Tonight's lesson uh, is entitled um, How to Witness or How to Share Your Faith with Someone Who is Catholic. There's no, uh, I was trying to find a fancy title for that. There's just no way to make that a fancy title. You know? It's just, I think all of us uh, know someone who's who's Catholic, you know, uh, most of us anyways. Uh, both my mother and my father were Catholic, as was everyone in our family, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, everyone was Catholic, not only in my family, but in Lisa's family. Uh, those who are passed away and those who are still living uh, are all still Catholic, uh, very tenacious in holding on to their, uh, to their faith. I believe um, I have preached to a lot of people in uh, 35 years uh, on television and radio and all kinds of medias, uh, but I've never had a Bible study with one of my family. This is how strong the, uh, uh, the desire not to have a Bible study um, has been. So I know a lot of the things not to do. You know, I haven't figured out all the things to do, but I surely can share with you the things not to do uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that goal. So uh, having a Bible study or sharing your faith, uh, your biblical faith, uh, with someone who has a Roman Catholic background is difficult, not impossible. Um, so I'd like to give you um, um, a little bit of background on how perhaps you might, uh, you might do that. Uh, first of all, it's good to understand, uh, helpful rather, to understand that Roman Catholics are the largest group among those who identify themselves as Christ Christians in the USA. Let's get that out of the way. All right. Of all of those people that identify themselves as being Christian in the United States of America, the Catholic Church is the largest of that group. 23% of those who claim to be Christians in the United States are Christians, uh, are uh, Roman Catholics rather. Uh, if you're wondering about some other stats, 25% Pentecostals. 25% of the people who claim to be Christians are, are Pentecostals in the United States. Uh, that's the fastest growing group. Um, Southern Baptists, you know, 6%, still a large group, 6%. Uh, I know the question you're all wondering. <laughs> uh, Churches of Christ, 2%. 2% of the people who claim to be Christian in the United States, members of the Churches of Christ. We are tied with the Mormons. We get same, you know, we're ninth position with the Mormons. Uh, we're ahead of the Jehovah Witnesses as far as the numbers are concerned. So that gives you an idea how, the reason I give you those stats is because I want you to understand how large the Catholic Church is in the United States. We're in the Bible Belt here and we think, oh, you know, everybody's a Baptist or everybody's a member of the Church of Christ. But no, the largest group in the United States, still Catholic. So when sharing your faith with someone of that persuasion, here are some of the things that you need to remember and do. First of all, remember that they think that they are the true church and they speak for Christianity. Okay? It's not a question of pride or anything like that. They just assume you know, that they are the true church. And why not? They're the largest. They're the richest. They have the oldest traceable history for a group, if you, if you understand what I mean. Okay. They have more church buildings than anybody else. They have more parachurch organizations, such as hospitals and orphanages and schools and social programs for the poor than all of the other Christian groups combined. They have the greatest number of clergy the greatest number of support personnel, they have the highest profile, and they are the most powerful politically here. Why do you think when something happens in the news and they're looking for a, uh, a quote or they're looking for you know, an opinion from a religious leader, why is it always 
one of the bishops that they talk to or one of the cardinals you know, in the Catholic Church. You know, you're saying, why don't they call Marty up? You know, he, he'd have something to say, why don't they do that? Well, 23%, biggest, most powerful, richest, that's why. So they see themselves as the only true church and they have the, quote, statistics to prove it. Uh, an amusing anecdote, there was a small uh, a group you know, from one of the colleges down here that were, was coming up to Montreal, wants to do some campaign work. You know? And um, they were crossing the border into, you know, to, to Canada and the, the guy said, uh, you know, the, the border guy said, so why, you know, where are you from? We're from such and such. Where are you, why are you going to Montreal? And they said, well, we're missionaries. And the guy smiled and said, you're what? We're missionaries. And he said, well, what church are you with? And they said, the Church of Christ. And he said, never heard of you. Well, in the United States, we certainly do. Restoration Movement, Churches of Christ, we have presence. We have you know, universities and we have large churches and that, but in Montreal, are you kidding me? In a city of three and a half million people, we had perhaps 500, 500 people who were members of the Church of Christ. But there were 300 Catholic churches, 300 of them. And 80% of the population were Catholic. You know what I'm saying? The first thing you see when you're driving to Montreal up on, the, on Mount Royal is the humongous St. Joseph's Oratory and you can see it for like 25 miles away. You can be 25 miles away from the city and you're driving towards Montreal and you look up at Mount Royal and right there on the top is St. Joseph's Oratory. So you can understand the, the border guy, you know, his confusion when these enthusiastic teenagers said, well, we're going over to Montreal to convert people. We're missionaries. He didn't, he didn't quite understand that idea. So any discussion that begins by attacking this position or a suggestion that the, quote, the Church of Christ is really the true church, a group that most Catholics have never even heard of, Anything like that will immediately make you look like a cult in their eyes and they will dismiss you out of hand. You won't even get to first, but you won't even get to open your book. You won't even get to open the Bible. I mean, they'll still make polite conversation, but they won't take you seriously if that's the tack that you take. If you say, I'm coming here to teach you, we're the true church, you guys are the false church, we're going we're to teach you, you know, you've lost them right, right away. So don't, quote, attack the Roman Catholic Church itself. Even if a Catholic person complains or criticizes it, don't you do it. Don't you jump on that bandwagon. You know how it works. It's like a family. Brothers and sisters are fighting like cats and dogs and they never get along and so on and so forth. But don't let somebody from outside the family attack you. Then everybody, you know, kind of comes back together again. You, know, you can talk bad about my brother. I mean, I can talk bad about my brother over here, but you can't do it because we're brothers. That's how that works. So you might say that all religious groups have flaws. You, know, you might say that if, they, if they're whining and complaining about the Catholic Church. You even say, well, even, even in the churches of Christ, we have our flaws as well. Nobody's perfect. But don't join in or begin by tearing down the Catholic Church. It's tempting and actually it's kind of easy because there's so many targets that you can choose from, but don't do it. It, it won't work. It won't, it won't get you very far in sharing your faith with someone who is Catholic. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Even if they are disgruntled and angry against their own church, don't, don't jump on that bandwagon. It won't get you far. Uh, number two, remember that when speaking to someone who is Catholic, remember that you speak the same words as they do, but the words have different meanings for them as they do for you. Okay? So you're all using the same words, but what those words mean to you is not the same thing as those words mean to someone who's been brought up as a Catholic. 
Catholics are difficult to teach because they use the same language as we do, but they don't realize that it means something totally different to them. For example, take the word uh, baptism, a simple word. When you say baptism to someone who's Catholic, when you say that word to them, the image that they have is a baby. A baby, um, a party, you know, there's a party when somebody, when little babies are baptized, there's a, a kind of quote christening type of party. That's what they think. They think ritual, they think godparents, who are your, who's your godfather going to be, who's your godmother going to be, that's what they think. Everybody there with the baby all dressed in a special little gown, handing it over to the priest, and the priest will do his ritual with the water. That's what they think when you say the word baptism. Of course, what you're thinking is, you're thinking an adult. You're thinking at least someone the age of reason. You're thinking not you know, a party and you know, let's have music and let's have some fun. You're not thinking that at all. You're thinking, well, perhaps at the church building or at camp or in a pool, somewhere like that. You're obviously thinking you know, an immersion. You're seeing this as a very special uh, spiritual uh, moment, not so much as a ritual. So you, you're, you know, what you have in your mind and what they have in their mind, that's completely a different thing. You say the word holy. And in their mind, when you say something's holy, they're thinking something is very quiet, something's very special, a ritual of some kind. That's what holy. To us, holy uh, refers to something that is pure, something that is dedicated. We're not thinking in the same way. Use the word church. They're thinking of a basilica, an institution. We're thinking of people. We're actually thinking organization, aren't we? Say the word Bible. Say the word Bible, and they're thinking a product of the church. If I might share with you a very short anecdote about my own history uh, coming out of Catholicism. You know there are key moments in your life when you realize something, you know, when the little light just goes on, you know, all of a sudden you go, whoa, I've just had an, an insight. Okay? I'm going to tell you the insight that I had that finally released me, disengaged me from the Catholic Church. Because remember, I, I was born and raised in the Catholic Church. I was an altar boy. I, I went to Catholic school. I was in seminary. I, 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 you know, I, I, yeah, I did all those things. Okay, as I even thought at one time maybe becoming a priest or a brother, you know, even thought of going into that. So I know about Catholicism, the thing that really disengaged me from it was when I understood the idea that the church is a product of the Bible and not the other way around. Because I had been taught, not overtly, but the idea that came across ever since I was a child was that the Bible was something that the church produced. And so therefore the church the Catholic Church, had the right to interpret it and to tell me what it meant and so on and so forth because the church produced it. You see what I'm saying? And the priest was the one that would explain to me what I needed to know and the Pope would decide what, you know. And so as I began reading the Bible for myself, I understood, wait a minute, the Bible is not a product of the church. The church is a product of the Bible. It's the Bible that's produced the church. You understand what I mean. I'm using short form language here, but it's, it's the word of God that, that brought into being the church and not the, other, not the other way around. So understand that when you're talking to a Catholic and you're talking Bible, they understand it's this book, but from their perspective, this book is a product of the church, not the other way around. If you say the word saved, salvation, in their mind they're going to think, yeah, yeah, a relationship with the church. Sure, all Catholics are saved. But when you think about the word salvation, what are you thinking about? Well, you're thinking about a personal relationship with Christ, a saved relationship with Christ, aren't you? Different thing, when you talk about Jesus even, we're talking about, oh, Jesus this and Jesus that. Try to understand, every time you push the button, Jesus, 
with a Catholic, there are three images that pop up, one of three images. A baby, right? A corpse, or a figurehead. That's, that's, because you go to any Catholic church, what will you see? You'll see a baby. You'll see a baby in a manger, or you'll see one of the saints, usually Joseph or Mary, carrying a baby, and the little baby's got a crown. All the uh, 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 icons, all the icons in the Catholic Church, most of them anyways, portray Jesus as a, either a little baby or as being dead on the cross. Okay? Of course, we're taught from the scriptures, the image that we get when we're talking about Jesus, we see a person. We usually imagine him, if you wish, when we're praying, as a grown up person, don't we? A person who speaks, a person who gives instruction, a person who gives insight into the mysteries of God's word and so on and so forth. You know? Yeah, we see him as a baby, we read about that. And yes, of course, on the cross, but those aren't the immediate images that we have. In our minds, we're seeing a living person from generation to generation. And so it goes on and on. I think I've given you enough examples here. The same words mean different things to Roman Catholics as they do to us, which causes difficulty in having a meaningful and productive conversation. I've seen people, I've observed people trying to convert a Catholic using the five-step approach. Now, is the five-step wrong? Well, of course not. It's, it's a biblically-based idea. You know, and it answers the question, how do I respond to God's gracious offer of salvation? Well, I hear the word, I, 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 I believe the word, I repent of my sins, I confess Christ, I'm immersed in the water. You know, it's my response to God. My expression of faith is encapsulated in these five steps, but I've actually seen people trying to convert a Catholic by explaining very slowly, talking very slowly about if I talk very slowly and explain these five steps, they will be converted. Well, and then many times, discouraged because we've explained it very carefully, but the people have not responded to us. I would first say that if, you've, if the only thing you've taught them are these five things, well, you haven't yet preached to them the gospel. You know, the gospel is not the five step. The gospel, as, you, as we've said before, is, um, is a God deciding to save us through His Son, Jesus Christ, vicarious atonement, on a basis of faith rather than a basis of the law or perfectionism. That's the good news. Oh, wonderful news. What, what shall I do as they asked in Acts chapter two? Well, repent and be baptized. You know? So you can't, you can't explain the five steps before you explain what the gospel is. So when you do that, you may be indoctrinating them with part of the truth, if you wish, but it won't convert them and it won't wean them away from their Catholic loyalty. So be careful about the words that you use. All right, a third thing, there are a lot, but you know, sermons have a certain time limit here. A third thing, understand the difference between where they are coming from and where you are coming from. The biggest difference between them and us is the way each is governed. The way each is governed. In the Roman Catholic Church, the basis of authority is shared by three equally authoritative sources. Okay? First, um, the Bible, which is the basis for much of its teaching. People who say, oh, Catholics don't use the Bible. No, that's not true. Catholics do use the Bible. It's the base, if you wish, for their core beliefs. I mean, I learned as a child growing up uh, that Jesus Christ was divine. I, where did I learn that? Well, from the Catholic Church, that there's only one God. Yeah, I learned in the Catholic Church. The sinfulness of man and so on and so on. All these core ideas are based in the Bible that the, that the Catholic Church uses. Another area of authority for them is the history of the practices of the Catholic Church. In other words, things are allowed or forbidden based on the tradition of the church. 
You know, like we have in the Supreme Court or in any type of judicial system, uh, 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 they're looking for precedent, right? Lawyers are always searching the law books for precedent. What did the court decide 100 years ago or 50 years ago on a similar case? And they bring case law, right, to prove their point. Well, it's the same thing in the Catholic Church. There are actually Catholic attorneys, lawyers, that don't study the civil code or the criminal code, they study Catholic doctrine and decisions that have been made by the bishops and by the Pope throughout the centuries to look for precedents and so on and so forth to argue for certain points of practice within the church. For example, the Catholic Church teaches about baptism and that it is necessary. It teaches that, why? Because that's a basic doctrine of the Bible. You just can't get around that idea. However, infant baptism, which they practice, they do this because the tradition of the church has done it this way for almost a thousand years. And so the idea that the tradition of the church and the tradition of its practices over centuries that, that idea has as much weight as the Bible. You see what I'm saying? We, we don't have that. Well, we have our own version of that, but not, not to the extent that the Catholic Church has it. So there's the two sources of authority, the Bible, the traditions of the church, and then the third is the teachings of the Pope. When the Pope issues an official teaching, what's called ex cathedra, from the chair of of Peter, for example, on a teaching or an interpretation, then that teaching is binding. And so the Pope decides what the Bible teaches, the interpretation of the Bible, where the Bible should be silent, and so on and so forth. The Pope has that particular um, authority. The idea of the infallibility of the Pope, that doctrine is uh, barely 100, 200 years old and was fought tooth and nail, as a matter of fact, by bishops and cardinals when it was proposed, but it was, it was won over by a vote, by a vote. Men gathered together and came up with the idea of papal infallibility, meaning when the Pope decrees something from a particular position, when he sits in the chair of Peter, okay, that he will be infallible. Men decided this idea. And so you have to understand when, a, when the, the doctrines of the church and their practices are based on not only the Bible, but the Bible, the traditions of the church, the teachings of the Pope. So if there is confusion or uncertainty, the Pope has the final word. All right, so remember I said how they are governed, okay? Secondly, uh, in the Church of Christ, to base our authority, or rather the base of our authority, is simply the Bible and only the Bible. Oh, I know we have our traditions, if you wish, Sunday night church, that, those are sort of traditions, if you wish. You know? But our basis is only the Bible. Okay? Church tradition, we know, can be changed. Right? Because it's just a tradition. We met at 10, well now we're going to meet at 9. Next week there's a picnic. The elders say, have decided, well, there'll be way too much activity. We'll have our morning service and communion and so on and so forth. We'll have the picnic, but the evening service will be canceled next week. It's a tradition that we can move around if, if we want to. There is no hierarchy of clergy that rules over the worldwide Church of Christ. Each congregation is autonomous. For example, each congregation has its own individual structure of leadership. According to the Bible, the evangelists, uh, if there are no elders uh, serving, the evangelists appoint the elders according to the word. And the congregation selects deacons and the elders ordain evangelists. And in a congregation where there are already elders in place, new elders are appointed based on their qualification and the approval of existing leadership. You know, we do things, we, we can actually uh, 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 quote chapter and verse for all of the practices that we do. If I were a Catholic, I could quote a chapter or a verse and the tradition of the church and the teaching of the Pope. And if there's nothing in the Bible, then I can go with the tradition or the teaching of the Pope. And if there's somehow some conflict in the Bible, 
uh, a presentation, then the Pope will decide. He gets to decide. So the fact that we say we're based only on the Bible may seem self-righteous if we don't qualify this with the idea that we use only the Bible as, at our, as our attempt to practice New Testament Christianity. I always tell people we are, we are attempting to practice New Testament Christianity based simply on what the scriptures teach. We don't always get it right, but we're trying to get it right. Okay? So if you understand the difference and are able to explain the difference without offending them, then you will set the stage for the second step in witnessing, teaching, or sharing your faith uh, with uh, someone of the Roman Catholic uh, religion. And that is getting them to read the Bible for themselves. People say to me, because they know my Catholic background, I say, well, how do you study? How do you convert a, a Catholic? What's the system? Do you use the Jewel Miller system? You know, Ivan Stewart, you know, World Bible. What do you use? You know, I said, no, I don't use any of those. I mean, those are, are good. My, my number one goal with uh, someone who's Catholic is to actually get them to read the Bible. <laughs> if I can get them to read the Bible, boy, half the, half the battle is won. So as I say, the primary goal in sharing your faith is to get them to read the Bible for themselves. And this is difficult for several reasons. First of all, Roman Catholics think that it is not possible for an ordinary person to really understand and handle God's word. They don't think that's possible. The Pope and the clergy do this for them and implicitly suggest that the Bible is too complicated and mysterious and dangerous for an ordinary person to handle by themselves. I still remember one of the headlines in the major newspapers in Montreal, I mean, screaming, big type headline, uh, um, man kills self and wife after reading Bible. <laughs> I mean, how they, got, how they put all that together. So the main argument is that, the, the, the main argument of, the, of Catholic people is that the Protestants have tried to handle the Bible and the result has been disagreement and division for 400 years. It's, it's, it's a pretty good argument. They say at least we Catholics, we're just sticking together. You know, but you, because they don't see the difference between you know, Church of Christ, Methodist, they just lump everybody together. You know. They say, well, you Protestants, you know, you're so smart. I said, you guys have been dividing and dividing and dividing for 400 years. What's the point of reading the Bible? And of course, the answer to that is that even churches in the New Testament time had division and disagreement, but they were still encouraged to grow in knowledge and unity through an understanding and obedience to the word. The, the idea is that the church has always been in turmoil. There's always been the temptation to divide. There's always been infighting inside the church, nothing new. Nothing new, study you know, 1 Corinthians, you'll get, you'll, get a, you know, you'll get an eyeful of what's going on in a church. But the scriptures always encourage us to pursue peace, the unity of the spirit, the bond of, of peace. And Jesus commanded that we all learn to obey His commands, Matthew 18 to 20. He put that, that personal responsibility on us. It doesn't say, and make sure your leaders teach you. No, 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 it was make sure you, you uh, are taught to obey all the things that I have uh, commanded. And the apostles taught the disciples God's word every single day at the beginning, Acts 2, 42, and they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, okay? Another reason why they're reluctant to read the Bible is that they equate the Bible with cultism. Okay, and the greatest fear that my in-laws had was that I belonged to some sort of sect, some crazy cult. And the only evidence that they might have had of that was that I read the Bible for myself. Now many Roman Catholics identify people who use and read the scriptures simply as cults. They're just, oh yeah, you're, you're with those guys. So there are the Protestants, and the Protestants are the ones that don't have the Pope, Okay, and then there are the cults, these people that are all hepped up on the Bible, are always reading the Bible to you. So if you only base your church on the Bible, then 
you know, you're like the Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons or even worse. You know? And the thing about that, I mean, that really gets it complicated, is that we're called the Church of Christ. <laughs> right? And so any door knocking or any outreach, especially in Montreal, you had to spend the first 20 minutes telling them, no, 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 I'm not a Mormon. <laughs> because the Mormons have a way higher, they don't have more people than us, believe it or not, but they have a way higher profile than we do because they spend millions and millions of dollars on advertising. Okay? So they see the Bible, uh, uh, excuse me, they see Bible-based living as an aberration or as a fanaticism because of the bad press that some cults have received. So you have to demonstrate that normal Christian lifestyle is not cultic. You know, we can be zealous for God without being antisocial or fanatics. After all, Jesus wants us to be lights and salt, not explosions, right? Not hot peppers. And so I'm saying to you, I'm not saying to you don't act like that. I'm saying to you understand that when you're talking to a person who is Catholic and you're talking to them about the Bible and, and, and so on and so forth, realize what they're thinking and they're scrutinizing you in a certain way. Uh, a story that we like to tell is one, one year Lisa and I decided to play a joke on our family, just you know, a crazy thing. You know? I said, let's send them Christmas cards in October. You know? And in the cards we'd say, Merry Christmas, we want to be the first ones to wish you Merry Christmas. It was just a joke, you know? just we sent them out. And then we had a family dinner or something like that and we showed up and it was like, are you okay? In your religion, do you celebrate Christmas at another time? I mean, they, they didn't get the joke. They didn't get the joke and we were too immature at the time to understand how this would look to them. They were always, uh, it was always uh, uh, prefaced with, in your religion, can you have pork chops? You know? This, this, type of, this, type of, this type of thing. All right, and then another reason why they don't get into the word of God, and, and I think this is the major one, they are afraid of leaving the mother church. The mother church. In the churches of Christ, we talk about the church using many different images, don't we? And the closest thing that we come to in feminizing the church is calling the church the bride of Christ, don't we? Right? A whole, not a whole lot of teaching on Mary other than perhaps you know, teaching her as a personality in the Bible and so on, a person in the Bible, but you have to understand the cultic type devotion that Catholics have for Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the church, the mother church. You know, it's a very matriarch, even though it's a man who is the Pope, and even though this latest pope has said no women are supposed to be uh, uh, priests, you know what I'm saying, still holding the line on that particular idea, what we need to understand is that the Catholic Church is a very matriarchal idea, emotionally, okay? And so Catholicism is tied into culture and it's nurtured from birth. Catholics, even if they are dissatisfied, with the church and their religion are always nostalgic about it nevertheless. They never go to church, but when they get married, they want to have a huge church. Well, wait a minute, we do that here too. But anyways, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. They go to church once a year, you know, Christmas, midnight mass. They're very nostalgic for the, they never go to church, they don't support their church, they don't give any money to the church, they never serve the church, but if anybody says anything bad about it, or if anybody decides to leave the Catholic Church to find something more satisfying spiritually, they jump up and defend the mother church. I say that's just emotion. So reading and studying the Bible is the first step away from this comfortable religion that may be several generations old within their families. They feel that they are betraying their families by leaving the church, and the first step of this betrayal begins with Bible study. It's like you know, stepping out on your, on your wife, 
A Roman Catholic who studies the Bible is conspicuous among his Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. So there's reluctance to take up this very first step. Now, if through careful conversation to explain the differences between Roman Catholics and the churches of Christ, if you manage to create a dialogue with a Catholic person, then you first, your first invitation should be to read the Bible with you. If you invite them to a worship service, they will usually decline because it is sinful in their own minds to do so. You're asking them to sin. It's like asking somebody here, you know, hey, let's go to the casino on Friday. Oh, I'm, I'm wrong there again. Uh, I'm weak, forgive me, I'm, I'm being bad now. But you understand what I'm saying. If you invite them to a worship service, you're inviting them to go against their conscience. So that's why it's such a difficult thing. They'll be polite and say, well, you know, I'm thinking about it, you know, so on and so forth, but you know, it's a really big, big step. In Protestantism, hey, Methodist goes on vacation, there's no Methodist church, well, we'll go to this Baptist church, or we'll go to this community church, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, we're all praising Jesus, right? But not for a Catholic, that doesn't, that doesn't work like that. And if they accept and go, they're usually very confused and threatened because our service is very inclusive and it's confrontational. We don't think it is, but to a Catholic mind, are you kidding me? The preacher at the end is, act is actually calling on the people in the pews to come on forward? Are you serious? That's incredibly threatening to someone who's never had that. I mean, when you confess your sins or acknowledge a wrong or something, where do you do it? If you know anything about it, you do it in a little dark room you know, where there's a screen and the priest can't see you. He knows who you are though. <laughs> you know, he knows who you are. But you know what I'm saying? That's the environment where you acknowledge a wrong or a weakness or a sin. And here we're saying, well, you know, if you've done this, this, and that, come on forward and tell the world. You know? So it's incredibly threatening. A better first step is to ask them to read, read, not study. Even the, the word study is not a good word. Study means work. It means that you will be the teacher and they will be the student. It means that they will be at a disadvantage if you say, would you like to study with me? You know, implied there is I'm going to teach you something. Catholics rarely study religion except in school and they feel that non-clergy persons are not qualified to teach them about religion. In Montreal, when doing mission work, the very first question that people used to ask me if we were to sit down or somebody would bring a student was, where did you go to school? Here, never it would happen. They'd say, well, you're a minister. What church are you with? Well, I'm with the church. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. You know, that's usually, in Montreal it was, so where did you do your seminary work? If you're going to teach me something, where, do you have a degree? Are you qualified? Very, very important. That's why you need to stay away from that word study. But if you read together, then it's a shared experience by equals. And the questions and the answers that come from such an activity are a dialogue rather than a teaching learning experience. You see, the, it's subtle, but it's, it's, you know, it's important. Relying on the power of the word is critical when reaching Roman Catholics because they need to experience for themselves the power of God's word and they need to see for themselves how shallow and incorrect many aspects of the religion are when compared to the Bible. I want to tell you, you've hit the jackpot when with your Catholic friend or family member or whatever, you're just reading together and they say, wait, 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 I want to go back. Now it says here this and this and this, right? Yes, and, and, uh, but we don't do that in, our, in the Catholic Church. I said, no, I guess you don't. Well, why is that? I said, I, I don't know. But in the Bible it says that we ought, to, we ought to do that. I said, yes, I know. 
And I mean, you need to be patient. Your little heart is going, oh, 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 oh. They're getting it. Because one of these days, the big question is, uh, which way are you going to go here? See what I'm saying? Because in the end, the question for the Roman Catholic and all of them, and you know, we're, we're filming this, going to be on my website, watch the emails that are going to start coming in after this one, but I'm telling you people who are watching this one day, as a Catholic, this is how I came to realization. In the end, the question will become, what will I believe? The teachings of my church about my Christian faith or the teachings of the Bible about these very same matters of faith? That's, that's why I say, let's just read the Bible and let's just allow God's word to do the converting here. You don't have to twist anybody's arm. Because you don't have to read very far from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. You don't have to get very far before a question will come up and say, well, wait a minute, we don't do that, and we don't do this, and how come this is there, and so on and so forth. If they are allowed to see the difference and the inconsistencies between the Bible and their religion as they read God's word, they will be convicted by the word and not by the power of persuasion. And I read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Brothers and sisters, you have to trust the power of God's word, always, of course, but especially when reaching out to your Catholic friends and family. God's word has the power to reach them and to change their minds and to challenge their minds. You are only the guide, guiding them through the word. So, for those who would like more information, this is not a kind of a classic sermon here in, in the style of a sermon, more a class, I guess, but I thought the information was important to share. So for those who would like more information on sharing your faith with others, including Roman Catholics, I've left a small packet of information that might be helpful to you, and it's on the table on the, this side, south side, on the south side, just pick one up, it's two, three or four pages long, and put it in your Bible, I think it'll be very helpful uh, in the future when you have this opportunity. So as I close out this lesson, I encourage anyone here who may need the ministry of the church, that challenge, that in your face thing that we do, that we find simply normal, to hear your confession of faith and baptize you, if that's the case, to pray for your special needs, whatever those special needs are, our elders are always present to hear your requests and to pray for you, and of course to receive you into fellowship or to receive you back into fellowship if you have been separated from us. This is the ministry that we offer, this is the time that we offer it. Brother Bob has a, a song selected, uh, so let's stand, let's sing that song and consider if we are subject to the invitation tonight.